Thanks very much, Mary. So I should just uh, tell everybody here that we are recording the event, just in case you can't get, you haven't had enough of it. Uh, but al but also, uh, just turn that down. That's nice feedback. Um, better. But also, you know, if you do anything silly, it'll be recorded and evidence is right there. Okay. <laughs> So, um, my name's Campbell Gourley. I'm a member of the School of Biosciences here in the university, and I'm a member of a few different research groups. Uh, so, one is called the Kent Fungal Group, another one is called RAPID, so this is Resistance, Pathogenicity and Infectious Disease. So, we as researchers are very interested in infectious disease and what causes that uh, in a variety of different settings. But I'm also very, very pleased to be a member of this third group, uh, and this is a multidisciplinary team, or MDT as we call it, that as Mary uh, alluded to, has been formed to tackle a, a medical problem uh, that we find in cancer patients. And so what we hope to do in this lecture is hear from a number of different members of the team and we'll walk you through different parts of the process to where we are today. So, you know, what is the medical problem? How have we tackled it? What are the successes of the, the MDT? And then also, what the, the future benefits? So, what research projects have come out of this process that will really be helpful for, for patients going forward? And so, um, if I just very quickly introduce this multidisciplinary team, just to highlight uh, how multidisciplinary it actually is, we have two groups of people, broadly speaking. We have people from ECHUFT, which is East Kent Hospital University Foundation Trust, and they definitely need to work on shortening that, <laughs> that title. And the other researchers uh, come from the School of Biosciences at the University of Kent. So we have this nice fusion of university research uh, and clinical practice. So you will hear from a number of the people on this list. So we'll hear, first of all, we hear from Mr. Alistair Balfour, who is an uh, ear, nose and throat surgeon consultant for the hospital. Uh, then we will hear from speech therapists who are involved in the project. So we'll hear from Sarah Stevens and Leila Williams who are specialist speech therapists involved in this particular type of medical issue. Then we'll hear from Professor Fritz Mulschlegel who is the clinical director of pathology. Um, and then we'll hear about some of the research that happens. So we'll hear from two PhD students that are engaged in research that has come out of this process. But you'll see there are uh, quite a few other names on here as well. So for example, Carolyn McCall and Madhu uh, are ENT specialist nurses that are involved in the MDT team. And then um, we have down here the School of Electronics and Digital Arts and we also have the School of Physical Sciences involved in the research projects that you'll hear about. So really it's a really, it really is a very multidisciplinary unit that we have formed. Okay, so um, without further ado, what we'll do is we'll just introduce each speaker in turn and hopefully they will tell you about their discipline and hopefully we'll see how it all knits together within this project. So if I could invite Mr. Alistair Balfour up onto the podium, he will tell you about the surgical aspects of this project. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Fingers. <laughs> First time. Thank you, Campbell. Um, is this going to work? Okay, yes. So my name is Alistair Balfour. I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon based at East Kent Hospitals. And um, it's a real honour to talk to you all today, but it's a real privilege to be part of this team. Um, working in a, in a group that I've never been exposed to before. I train as a doctor, I work as a doctor, I super specialise as a doctor, and all of a sudden I've been part of this group with really, really varied um, skills um, uh, and experience, uh, in it, which has enabled this project, which has really made a difference for our head and neck cancer patients. Um, my role in this is to create the problem, really. So... I'm the surgeon that uh, removes the larynx and um, 
puts in a speaking valve, and it's the speaking valve that we're going to come back to a lot in these talks, that, co that produces huge benefits but creates some very specific problems that need addressing. I'm going to set the scene by talking about, by introducing uh, what the problem is. And we're going to talk about speaking valves, but first of all we need to talk about uh, the larynx, um, laryngeal cancer and the big operation laryngectomy. So we all know that the larynx is the voice box, right? Wrong. It's not a voice box. <coughs> the voice, box, voice part of things is actually a secondary function. The larynx functions to allow us to breathe and to eat and drink. So we've got this really stupid um, design in that everything we eat comes in through our mouth and goes down our gullet, and we breathe air through our mouth and our nose down here, but it goes, has to go down into our windpipe. It's crazy that we've got one opening, um, but then it has to separate into two different uh, pathways. And the larynx here, the, the voice box, its primary function is to allow us to breathe, air to go the right way, to send air down here, and to send food and drink down here. But it's a, it's a byproduct of that valve function, um, is that it, when you breathe out and the vocal cords come together, they can create sound. And that allows us to speak, which for humans is uh, such an incredible, incredibly important part of uh, community, how we communicate, how we've developed as a society. Shouldn't be underestimated. Um, so moving on, I'm just going to touch on laryngeal cancer. What is it? Cancer of the voice box. Head and neck cancer overall is the fifth most common cancer, but it's a really debilitating cancer, which so, so much affects what we do, how we survive, eating, drinking, breathing, communicating. The larynx is the second commonest site of cancer in the head and neck. Um, and lifetime risk is much more common in men. It's about 1 in 175 men, about 1 in 800 women. Um, and the burden of this disease is about two to 2,500 patients in the UK diagnosed with laryngeal cancer each year. Um, it is primarily smoking-related, and I think the numbers are coming down. Well, they certainly are coming down over recent years. So there have been... Uh, improvements made. Um, fortunately with laryngeal cancer it does present early because there's a sign of laryngeal cancer. You develop hoarseness. Um, however the downside of that is hoarseness is so common that some people often put up with it and ignore it. But still we see the majority of laryngeal cancers early and with early diagnosis we can treat it and preserve the voice box, preserve the larynx. However there are a number of cases where the disease is too advanced, where we have no option other than to remove the affected organ. Or if our treatment options have run out because we've tried them before, such as radiotherapy, and it comes back, we have to remove the larynx. So there's about 400 to 450 laryngectomies in the UK each year, and in East Kent, about eight a year. It may not sound like much, but it's a really successful operation. The majority of our patients go on to live very full and normal lives. And so we have a sizable population of patients in East Kent who have had laryngectomies. I should warn you, some of the slides might be a little bit gruesome. Um, so if you want to <laughs> um, close your eyes and get your, a, a neighbor to nudge you when it's um, okay, please feel free. <coughs> Okay, warning over. Um, so this is what laryngeal cancer looks like. This is, this is what we see when we examine a patient in clinic or in theatre. We have a look down at the voice box. Luckily, majority of cancers are like this, a small nodule. And we can treat that. We can laser it away or we can treat it with radiotherapy and maintain the function of the larynx so somebody can breathe, they can eat and drink, and they can talk. But then we have a small number of patients with very large tumours like this. You can't preserve the larynx, you can't maintain its function to breathe, you can't maintain swallowing, and this larynx has to be removed. 
Um, and this is a laryngectomy. And this is a big operation. This takes about eight hours to do this operation. This involves a, an incision which goes from ear to ear across the neck. We have to expose every organ in the neck and the larynx sits in here. We have to remove the larynx. We'll move on. That's what my role is, to do that. And then we end up with this situation, which is actually a really good design. This is somebody who's had a laryngectomy. The larynx, which was sitting here on that very first slide, is gone. And what you left is with a, a really safe situation here. You eat food and drink, it just goes down a single tube. Um, it is safe, it's away from the airway. And our airway is here, so the windpipe comes straight out to the neck. It does mean two openings, one for eating and drinking, one for breathing. So for function, for life, this is an effective situation to be in. But with this, you lose the ability to produce sound and speak. The, we do have a way to restore speech, and the best way to restore speech is with a speaking valve. I'm going to touch on it very briefly, because the next talk will go into this in a lot more detail. And we do have a little plastic tube that we can put in uh, from the airway to join the airway to the gullet, which is just behind. <coughs> and it sits in here. And with a little speaking valve like this, it is possible to direct breath from the lungs up to the windpipe, into the throat where it vibrates, makes sound and out through the mouth. But it can go wrong and it can leak. Food and liquid can go the wrong way and there are problems and this can be dangerous uh, leading on to chest infections. That is as much as I'm going to say about that because Sarah and Leila are going to go into a lot more detail. But hopefully that's just set the scene um, as what the problem is, why we've got to this problem, and this is a problem that needs resolving, and the rest of the group are going to answer those problems. So I should say we'll, we'll take questions to everybody at the end, just to, just to make sure we finish the lecture. Okay, so if you've got a question, remember it, and ask Alistair either at the end, or you can catch him over a glass of wine at the end. Okay, thank you very much, Alistair. So now we move on to the person who solved the problem, or the discipline that solved the problem, the speech therapists. And so I think Sarah and Leila are going to divide the task and talk together. So, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? <coughs> and everywhere in between? Yeah. Good. Ah, pointer. So Leila and I come as a double act. <laughs> um, let me work this. No, what did I do wrong? Aha. So um, as Alistair just touched on, um, we use a voice prosthesis. I've got one in my pocket here. Well, what we can do is, just to be fancy, Oh. we can check it on here, and uh, just so everyone can see it, hopefully. There we go. Oh, that's very exciting. Is that good or do you want to zoom oh, in further? Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Um, you'll have to tell me how to come back to the other bit in a minute. It's just PC when you want to go back. Okay. See that? Does it? Looks, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Can you edit that a bit out? <laughs> Um, as Alistair just touched on, there, there are risks attached with this voice prosthesis, so why, why do we do it? Um, because it gives the most natural uh, method of communication for the majority of patients, so it is the best option for most people. And if I can show you, so you can see how small it is. It, has, it fits in the wall of the, um, between the windpipe and the gullet. This bit sits in the esophagus and you can see if I squeeze it, 
it has a little, oh, I can't see what I'm doing. It's got a little um, flapper, a little one-way valve. And what that serves to do, right, PC, yep. I was paying attention. So what that does is it sits in the wall. Uh, where's the point of that one? So here it is. It sits in the wall and allows the person to use air from their lungs to, to push through the voice prosthesis. What most people do is they use a finger or a thumb over the stoma uh, when they go to speak. And what that does is that allows the air to be diverted through the voice prosthesis, allows enough pressure to push open the valve when they speak. The air comes up through the reconstructed gullet and vibrates here and that vibrating column of air comes up through the mouth and is shaped by the, um, the, the articulators in the mouth to form the sounds of speech. And for most people, it, um, it gives a very um, functional voice. The voice might sound different. It almost always sounds different from how, it, how the voice sounded before they ever had a difficulty. And it, the, the quality of the voice varies from person to person. It, it may be that the, the voice is quite quiet and whispery. It can be quite resonant and loud. For most people, it's um, maybe a little deeper in pitch than it was before. Some people might have a bit of a squeaky quality to the voice, but, um, but most people will have a very functional voice and be able to use their voice in all of the situations that they would have usually um, before the operation. And for some people, the voice quality is actually better than it was even before the operation because, as Alistair touched on, a lot of the um, people who are, are diagnosed with a laryngeal cancer present with a, a hoarse voice. And for some people, it can be a, a whisper. It usually takes people a bit of practice to get used to using their new voice after their operation. Um, but usually people get there without too much trouble. The, the, the biggest hurdle is just working out where to put the finger or the thumb to get the best position to get a, a complete seal over the stoma so they don't lose air out of the sides of, of the stoma. Just to help orientate you a little more, I've got uh, a couple of... Well, I, I don't need to show you that photo now because you've seen it under the snazzy bit of kit, but... Um, here is um, the neck of somebody who's had a laryngectomy operation. Here's the stoma. And you can just see in the back wall of the trachea or the windpipe the front of the voice prosthesis. Voice prostheses don't last forever and they need to be periodically changed. Um, um, at some point, as Alistair touched on, the, the voice prosthesis will fail. And by failure, we mean that the valving mechanism fails to function. It fails to successfully, completely close to stop the contents of the, the gullet from leaking through into the airway. So when somebody has, has a drink, they can get bits of liquid leak into the airway through the voice prosthesis, which then causes them to cough. It can be very unpleasant for people, and it can be dangerous too, because if it's not dealt with quickly, it can risk a chest infection. So the voice prosthesis, when it starts leaking, needs to be changed as quickly as possible. Um, and it's quite a simple procedure. So after the original operation, once, um, once the, the voice prosthesis is fitted for the first time, after that it's quite straightforward. It's something that we do um, in the outpatient clinic at one of the main hospital sites um, across East Kent. And that will be done by either a specialist ENT nurse, a specialist ENT surgeon, or a specialist speech and language therapist. So why do they fail? The number one leading cause is candida, which is um, a type of yeast that occurs naturally in our bodies, but it can attach to the voice prosthesis and grow sort of small colonies, which we call plaques. This, this um, picture here shows you lots of little 
um, candida plaques which have grown on this voice prosthesis. It only takes one small voice prosthesis, uh, one small um, plaque of candida in just the wrong place. So just inside, um, inside the lip of the, um, the, the seat that the, the flapper sits on or just around the edge of the flapper for it to, to stop it from being able to close completely. Um, this one I just brought for illustration purposes. This is, not, this is not one of ours. This is one that I found on the internet. <laughs> Um, it ju but I just wanted to show you the, the potential extent of the problem. Most of our patients will not get to this stage. Um, I, I expect that this voice prosthesis failed quite a lot sooner than, than it was removed. Our patients are, are, are educated to alert us when there's a problem, so they, they come in soon and get it dealt with quickly. I did have a poor lady once who lived overseas and... Um, contacted me when she arrived in Britain. She, she lived between Britain and, and somewhere in, in the, it was Spain. And she hadn't been able to access health care that she needed in Spain. So when she came back to me, when I pulled it out, it did look a bit like that, unfortunately. <coughs> um, device lifespan is really variable from one person to the next. And in, in the extremes, we've had patients whose voice prosthesis have lasted four to five years um, and at the other end of the scale, we've had a few where they've lasted maybe two to three weeks. Um, we hope that they'll last around six months as a minimum. And if they fail sooner than six months, we consider that to be early voice prosthesis failure. Is there anything else I need to say about that? I think I'm done. I can hand over the baton. I removed the tissue so I didn't have tissues falling out of my pocket. Yeah. Do you want that? Um, um, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, as Sarah's touched on. Um, oh, give me that, sir. Yes. Yes. As Sarah's touched on, um, we were finding that many, many of our patients were presenting with candida. Well, we suspected candida as the, the cause of their early voice prosthesis failure. And uh, we didn't really know what to do to help them. This was sort of a new area for us. And so over the years, clinicians have used different anti-candida anti medications, um, but there hasn't really been clear guidance on, on how to manage the issue. So which anti-candida medications to use, what the dose should be, how to administer them. Um, so we really didn't know the best approach. And we should say that these anti-candida medications are, are used to treat um, infections in the mouth or in the throat, so something like oral thrush, not, not voice prostheses. Um, so it's a really specialist area, and there was limited research, um, so, well, limited research into the growth and treatment of candida in relation to voice prostheses. So we recognised that we needed a clear and, and, and replicable approach to treating this problem. Um, that led Sarah to talk to Fritz, who quite rightly suggested we needed, we needed to seek expert opinion from a range of disciplines. So we got together our multidisciplinary team, represented by ENT, microbiology, pharmacy, the fungal research experts from the University of Kent, and speech and language therapy. So we have developed, um, well... First of all, we reviewed the evidence base and then we sort of sought consensus or expert opinion when the evidence base was lacking. And as a group, we've developed um, some robust clinical guidelines. Now, we meet routinely as an MDT and um, over really several years, and we've been developing these guidelines over that time. We've had to take them through various panels and committees in both the acute and community hospital trusts. Um, and we've, we've needed to seek agreement from all of those bodies. And what these guidelines do is they describe a stage-by-stage -stage process for managing early voice prosthesis failure, um, where candida is the, is the, um, the problem. We should say that um, patients are using these anti-candida medications um, minimal amounts, and they're applying them directly to the voice prosthesis. 
So this, you may have heard of something called nystatin, there's another called myconazole. These are the two most commonly used anti-candida medications for our patients. And by applying the medication directly to the voice prosthesis, you're minimising um, the, amount that, uh, the amount of the drug that's being taken into, taken into the patient's body um, and applying it directly to where it's needed. So these guidelines have been presented by members of our team at an international, well, national and international level, and there's been a, a lot of interest. I think there were many clinicians in the position that we were where they were experiencing this problem but didn't really have a, a clear answer. And consequently, we've shared our guidelines with clinicians um, in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and as far as Australia as well. Um, so this is some data just from um, five of our patients, the sort of the worst offenders. Um, so particularly patient two, oh sorry, it shows the lifespan of the voice prosthesis before and after implementation of the, of the guidelines. So patient two um, shows the biggest change. So before implementation, the voice prosthesis, voice prosthesis lasted about three weeks and after it's increased to 65 weeks. Um, all of these patients here, their voice prostheses are lasting longer than six months now. It's so much better for our patients. It, there's less stress and disruption associated with frequent early voice prosthesis failure, frequent trips to the hospital. Having longer lasting voice prosthesis means that the, reduce, the risk of developing a chest infection is reduced. And for some patients, they're taking far less anti-candida medication than, than they used to because it's been applied as a small, small amount directly to the voice prosthesis. And understandably, it's so much better for the NHS. We're saving money, we're saving on, on clinician time as well. And just finally, a quote from one of Sarah's patients um, summarising the impact of the guidelines on him. Now it can be months before I have the prosthesis replaced when it used to be weeks the new pathway was a game changer for me. One more. Oh, there's, we snuck that one in. Oh. <laughs> that was without telling you. I haven't seen that. I've never seen it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> we snuck it in without telling you. Sorry, oh. Leila. Oh, that's oh. fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, So the, the guidelines have been published and, and released. And um, this is a map that I just, uh, just made of the number of places in the UK that have taken up the pathway, different trusts and hospitals around the UK. So you can see, and the, the, they were released in November 2016. So you can see already there's a, there's a very, very large uptake. And uh, as Leila said, it's also gone, gone uh, uh, to Australia now. And we, we really anticipate that it will be taken up very widely around the world. So it should make a very large impact on this type of care. So I'll pass over now to uh, Fritz Mulschlegel, who I would just say that it's actually his birthday today as well. So, <laughs> hip hip! <Hooray>! There we <laughs> go. <laughs> and actually, I should also say that Fritz has really been the glue that has held the whole package together. It was really him that brought together the MDT and I would say drove it forward. So. Uh, much gratitude for that, I would say. So if we hand you over to Fritz. And Fritz will tell you about bridging research and clinical practice. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, 28 trusts picking up the guidelines uh, the moment they were published. Um, a fantastic achievement in, uh, in, in that short space. So from the inception of the project, we really had two missions. One is uh, we wanted to do something um, clinically tangible, you know, real outcome, really measurable to uh, the patient, makes a real difference. But from the inception of the project, we also um, were keen to develop a vision, i.e. pair up with uh, leading research. Uh, uh, develop a, a research project that has longevity and, uh, and future impact, really. So not compromise on 
the quality of, uh, of the science. And uh, that was really, I think, the driver at the beginning when, when we put the MDT together to combine the two things. Uh, and in, in, in order to literally b bridge that, um, that, um, that momentum between the tangible clinical outcome for the patient and uh, the basic research, I need to tell you a little bit more about uh, the background about, around uh, the yeast, the fungus that uh, is uh, causing the voice box, the prosthesis, to fail. So um, Sarah and Leila have already mentioned Candida is, uh, is a fungal pathogen. Um, it's, it's, it's quite well known to us microbiologists because uh, it's uh, an important agent of uh, bloodstream infections in, in hospitals. A uh, large number of infections worldwide which um, have been and uh, in some countries still are associated with, uh, with a really high mortality. I have to say that microbiology here in East Kent has been really proactive in, uh, in addressing these issues and in fact we are one of five uh, uh, reference or collaborating mycology centers because we have uh, procedures in the lab in place in order to uh, diagnose, to differentiate and then to treat a fungal infection earlier really and, uh, and we're of course uh, very proud of, uh, of that uh, achievement. Um, Candida also rapidly colonizes voice prostheses and leads to the prosthesis failure and um, should say that candida can cause broadly two types of infections, superficial infections and then deep-seated infections which then um, colonize the kidneys or other deep-seated organs and, uh, and lead to organ failure. So, so, so very serious infections. Um, the hallmark, you can see that up here, of candida albicans the main agent of causing voice prosthesis failure is the fact that it changes its shape, it changes its, uh, its mortality between a little bit like uh, uh, mini pearls here or growing in long filaments and that's called polymorphism. It's capable to change shape all the time. And you can see that here as well. Here it grows in uh, in, it's called a yeast form, roundish, slightly elongated, single cell form. And here, when stimulated, it starts to filament enormously. Um, and this ability, this capability to change between a, a roundish form and an elongated form is really critical to its success as a pathogen. And we speculated to its ability to infect um, voice prostheses and cause uh, their failure. And in fact, in order to change, this is absolutely paramount for candida to colonize epithelial cells, to uh, penetrate um, into the sub-epithelial space, to invade into tissues, to then disseminate with the bloodstream and then to extravate or exit out of the bloodstream into the underlying tissue. So filamentation is absolutely key for candida being such a successful pathogen. Um, now filamentation is governed by signals that candida encounters inside the human bodies. For example, neutral pH. Candida can read, so to speak, neutral pH inside the human body and change cell shape. Almost like a mini sensor that knows exactly where it is inside the body. Another important signal that Canada reads is uh, environmental carbon dioxide. Essentially, when we respire, when we inhale, we do that in order to bring oxygen into our body. When we exhale, essentially what we do is uh, we get rid of carbon dioxide, which is formed during intermediate metabolism. We exhale oxygen, we, 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 we exhale carbon dioxide, we inhale oxygen. So the concentration 
of carbon dioxide in the airway tract really fluctuates quite significantly between inhaling and exhaling. Um, more than 150 fold, really, which is quite a big entity. When candida is exposed to physiological concentrations of carbon dioxide as found in exhaled air, it reads that and uh, undergoes a massive transition from yeast-like growth to filamentous growth. And you can see this is a massive signal that really transforms this fungus to undergo this morphologic transition. So very prominent, very strong signal. And Candida albicans is uh, sort of unique because, uh, yes, it is the most prevalent uh, human pathogenic fungus as a yeast, and yes, it can sense physiological CO2 and change its morphology. It's unique because some of, some of the other pathogens we encounter in the clinic, not as frequently, cannot do that. So it's special with, uh, with that regard. Um, Underlying this change from um, roundish growth form to filamentous growth form are a number of elaborate signaling cascades. And uh, we in Kent, we've always paired uh, good um, clinical practice, um, guideline development, um, uh, uh, patient-centered work with um, really quite um, strong basic research to understand what's the basic of uh, pathogenesis in, uh, in a yeast and uh, we've continued that uh, in uh, the, uh, the course of, uh, of this MDT. Um, so we asked um, a very basic question, does physiological CO2, does that impact on the damage that candida causes on a voice prosthesis and did a basic experiment really. You've seen already the, uh, the voice prosthesis and uh, we've infected that, so to say, with candida and exposed the infected voice prosthesis in air or elevated CO2. And what you can see here as little plaque-like structures which are magnified here really are all filamenting candida, which literally dig themselves into the underlying uh, surface, establish themselves firmly, stick to the material, and really are the seeding ground for um, voice prosthesis failure, which then moves on to uh, the, uh, the extreme situation that Sarah has shown you uh, before. So this is an example where we pair a really basic understanding of morphology and the signaling events in, in a pathogen to a very real clinical problem. Okay, thanks very much, Fritz. Grab that. Okay, so we've seen the, the clinical problem and we have shown you that we can treat that problem and the first is just to explain something about the physiology of the organism that causes the problem. But one of the things we really wanted to do was to uh, develop more sophisticated approaches to uh, dealing with the problem. And actually these approaches will become much more widely applicable to different medical problems, medical scenarios. And so uh, we have engaged with different schools in the University of Kent to achieve this. So we are bioscientists. But we've been working with uh, people from electronics and digital, digital arts. And uh, this is with John Batchelor, who's sitting right there, if you want to ask any electronics questions. And also with P uh, the School of Physical Sciences. Um, so Simon Holder and Aaron Hillier, who's also in the audience over there. So what we're going to hear are a couple of um, stories about these research projects from two of the PhD students that are undertaking the work. And first of all, we hear from Daniel Pentland, who is part funded by the Kent Cancer Trust. So he's supported by the, the trust in his research. Okay, so I'll just hook him up and we'll go for it. So then. Okay. <coughs> Hi, everyone. My name's Dan. And yeah, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the research side of the team. 
Um, the first thing we do when we're approaching a research problem is we look to try and formulate research questions so that we ha have a direction that our research is going in and we know what we're trying to answer. Um, so for this particular problem, we uh, formulated four um, sort of avenues of research that we wanted to look into. So one is how does CO2 affect biofilm formation by Kandra Abkins, which Fritz has already spoken to you about. Secondly, we want to look at how the microorganisms actually colonise the device. Thirdly, we want to try and look at, to see if there's any new therapeutic angles that we could exploit to try and prevent the biofilm formation, so the microbial colonisation of the voitable species. And lastly, which what Victoria is going to talk to you about after me, is um, can we increase the diagnostic capabilities to detect the growth first or earlier and then hopefully um, present a better outcome for the patient. So I've spoken about biofilms quite a lot in that slide. Um, so I thought I'd just put this slide in to make sure that everyone's aware of what I'm talking about. So a biofilm is a structured community of microorganisms which um, can be attached to either a living or non-living surface. So they're um, cells encased in a sort of jelly-like substance um, which is composed of DNA, matrix and polysaccharides, so like sugars. And medically they're very important because they, they contribute to about 80% of all infections and they also exhibit an increased resistance to antibiotic and antifungal drugs, so they can be very difficult to treat. So the first step which I did was to look at the clinical microbiology data coming out of the hospitals to try and identify what, um, what microorganisms, what species are consistently present and the main culprits for failing voice prosthesis. So we um, got 48 um, the data from 48 patients, which comprised 159 separate voice prosthesis failures. So this is from all over the East Kent area, and it's the largest data set of its time, and it's growing all, all the time. And we discovered that the biofilms are often a mixture, so they're not just one species which is present. It's often a mixture of ver a variety of different species, both fungal or yeast species, so these are all candida species, um, and al but also bacterial species, primarily Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so Candida albicans and Staphylococcus aureus, they're both normally found within the body and they don't cause any problem at all. But when a patient has a voice prosthesis or any foreign body or any foreign object within the body, that can provide a surface for these microorganisms to colonise and grow on. And when they grow on a surface like that, they're separate from the immune system. So the immune system cells can't get at them and can't prevent their growth. And that's when they grow and get out of control and can cause infection. Primarily, my research is focused on Candida albicans because um, Candida albicans forms the majority of the biomass which is found within these biofilms and is the main reason for the physical disruption of the valve um, within the voice prosthesis and the reason that it fails. Um, so this is a picture which you've seen that Fritz put up. Um, so we're looking at how do the microorganisms actually colonise the prosthetic device. So as you can see in this picture here before insertion, the voice prosthesis looks very smooth, very shiny, but that's not, when you get down to the sort of level that the microorganism sees it on, that's not actually the case. So this is an atomic force microscope image of a voice prosthesis. Um, this is just a technique which we use to get really high resolution images on a really small scale of uh, surfaces. And if you can imagine here, so this is a, a high full candida albicans cell and it can quite easily fit between these grooves on the voice prosthesis surface, become attached, and then start growing and causing the problem. So to look at new therapeutic approaches to prevent biofilm formation, we've got some promising results by looking at the mitochondria. So mitochondria um, are within fungal cells, they're also within our own cells, and they're the sort of... Uh, the workhorses of the cell, they're responsible for the generation of energy that your cells need to survive and to live. Um, and what we've shown is that this is just a wild type Candida albicans cell uh, with normal functioning mitochondria and it forms a biofilm quite nicely on these silicon surfaces. So these silicon discs are just um, in place of the voice prosthesis, it's the same material. Um, but what we see is when we grow a mutant Candida albicans cell, so it's got genes knocked out which affect its mitochondrial functionality. Um, so its mitochondria are no longer functioning correctly and they s exhibit really reduced biofilm formation. And leading on from this, um, repurposing drugs is something which um, could be very helpful for us because 
These two drugs here, sodium nitroprusside, SMP, um, and salicyl hydroxamic acid, SHAM, both target the mitochondria. They both target the energy production process within these cells, within microorganisms. And they're both licensed for safe use in humans, but they're not currently used as an antifungal uh, medication. So, but what we've shown with our research, a lot of, re a lot of work's gone into showing that by targeting this pathway in the mitochondria of the counteralbicans with these two drugs, which are already licensed for safe use in humans, um, that we can effectively block the biofilm formation from the counteralbicin cells. Um, I put this slide in just to show you how the SMP and SHAM affect the mitochondria. So these are both counteralbicans colonies growing on a media which provides a colour to the uh, colony based on the mitochondrial uh, status of the cell. So if the mitochondria is working correctly, then this media causes the colonies to be red. And if the mitochondria has been damaged in any way by the uh, application of these drugs, then the colonies appear white. So this just shows that the mitochondria has definitely been disrupted in these cells. And what we see is that when compared to current antifungal drugs, um, so drugs which are used within the pathway that Layla and Sarah told you about, so such as fluconazole, myconazole and nystatin, SMP and SHAM actually has comparable effects on the biofilm formation of the counterabricant cells. And it's important to be continually looking for new mechanisms to combat um, or to prevent microorganism growth because uh, resistance can emerge um, if you continue to use the same drugs over and over again, which are attacking the same mechanisms within the cell. So by identifying these two drugs, which are not currently used for antifungal treatment, um, that just gives further options for the future if resistance emerges. I'm now going to hand you over to Victoria so she can tell you about her research. best for last. Uh, so this is the last you have to hear of us and then we can have our reception. Um, I'm from I'm both in the biosciences as well as in the engineering. So I'm going to be talking about the engineering aspect of how to improve upon uh, patient care when it comes to these infections and these kinds of devices. So I'm going to talk about two main projects. We are developing an RFID sensor um, that will able to detect growth as well as we're working with the material scientists that um, we can actually make a new polymer that will prevent attachment or even kill if there is attachment. So we can, we can get it detected and we can also kill it. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about two projects and RFID is basically radio frequency identification. So that's like, you know, your radio in your car, that's radio frequency. Like that's what, that's what we're working with. Okay. Okay, so you just imagine, what if you had an app on your cell phone that you press the button, you put it next to your, to your neck, and you can detect growth. It will tell you, hey, um, we're fine, we're okay, or uh, maybe you should call your doctor. Where clearly there's an early onset infection, so please, you know, get new prescription or whatnot. Or what if you had a system set up in your house to your Wi-Fi? or a Bluetooth or anything that could actually, you get into your house, it reads you and tells you, oh, hey, you're fine, or once again, call your doctor. Or even now, this is, this is possible actually, we have smart hospitals or smart rooms in the hospital, or if you're laying down, it reads you automatically. So you're, while you're in the hospital, it's constantly reading you and telling you, oh, hey, there's an infection growing, or there's, you're fine, we're okay. Or even can tell, email your doctor, and say, come, you should come see this patient. Um, they might need a change or new medication or, you know, whatever. So this is actually possible. We have the technology and it's not applied to devices like this. So that is kind of where my research has gone. So um, due to patent laws and other things, I can't really show you the official devices. So I just made some mock ones. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. 
but I can't really show you <laughs> the devices themselves. So the idea is to basically, you need to make something um, that you can put or plant inside the device um, that could be used as basically an antenna or a sensor of the growth or of the infection. So I just kind of showed you like uh, here there's a little something that I just made random <laughs> on top of it. So you can kind of get an idea. This would be like called a patch antenna and it'd be right on top built into the actual device and on the side that most of the infection occurs, which is the side that's facing into your esophagus. So, I mean, it's a little an example. Um, so the basic idea is, okay, so you have your device with whatever sensor you have built in. Um, so no growth, nothing happens. Your readings are clear, they're not changing. Then you have, say, an infection occurs and growth of the biofilm occurs. So what happens? You have, once again, the device, infection occurs, and then we have, depending on your system, some kind of change in the electrical properties, and that we can detect. Depending what your system is made to detect, um, there's different options. There's <laughs> options for impedance, which is basically a fancy way of saying resistance with some imaginary numbers. <laughs> and then we also can detect a shift in just the frequency. So like the European frequency is about 868 range, around 860 to 870, something like that. And then we have the American, which is around 915 to 920. So um, if you have a system that's set up and it can actually detect a shift, you can automatically say, oh, hey, there's an infection because the system was affected. It's a very, it's a very simplified version. But <laughs> it sounds like very simple. It's like, why hasn't this done? Because basically what you have to imagine is that you have something like this. So this is an RFID tag. You can buy these pretty much anywhere. They're pretty expensive, sorry. I, have, uh, I got into a fight with the ninja, and anyways. Um, so ignore my, ignore my finger, and you have something like this. Well, imagine trying to fit that onto this. And then, not only that, and then shove it in a bucket of salt water. And then try to read it virously from outside the bucket and try to get a reading without any battery. So it's a very basic idea, but to do it and apply it is very complicated and has taken me 18 months to make a device that works. <laughs> okay. So currently, like I said, I can't show you sadly, but currently the device that I have uh, is smaller than 10, oop, smaller than 10 pence and um, can detect growth as early as, some of the prototypes can detect growth as early as eight hours. I have others that can detect the 24 and 48. So meaning once there's attachment, after eight hours of the biofilm developing, so there's a very early biofilm, we can actually see a change. Um, I have one that, like I said, I have some that work within the body and can be read up to one meter. The reason why I tell you the range is because it's very important when it comes to RFID development. The further the read range, the better the antenna inside of the body. Because once again, it's inside the body, so you're working against your own body's dielectric system, so dielectric properties. And your body is basically, like I said, seawater. So it's, it's very complicated. And to, and to try to make something work out inside your body and to come out of your body is very difficult. But I'm happy that I can cheat because you have the holder, so it makes it a little easier for me. Um, but I do have uh, prototypes that actually work in the European, the US, and also the Japanese. So they're all three different prototypes, um, and they all work in those frequencies. So I'm, I'm very, very lucky that you know, it made it easier for me with the whole. Uh, I'm not good for the patients, good for me. <laughs> um, and the goal is to have a fully functional uh, and optimized, that's the key word there, optimized prototype by the end of 2017. I already have some prototypes. Um, I'm trying to optimize it because we're trying to shift to a new chip inside of the um, antenna, like here, like I showed you over there, um, that can actually communicate um, what's called an EPC Gen 2 commands. 
So it sends out a mem basically has a little bit of memory, digital memory that it can send out. And the nice thing about that, you can buy a very cheap device. There's even devices, I think it's called from Sky RFID, that you can actually attach to your cell phone. Like one of those, you know, like when you go to pay for something and somebody has a tablet and they have the little attachment that you can just scan your, well, basically you can buy the same thing for those. So the only thing you would have to do is write up an app and plug it into your <laughs> cell phone and you can actually just press the button and you could have a system set up for any doctor, any nurse, any in your own home for yourself. It's very simple. That's why I want to switch to this new chip. So I'm trying to optimize my prototypes. And uh, okay, so now going towards the more material sciences. What if you ha didn't have to even worry about the infection itself? And what if you are, had the antifungal properties, antifungal medicine, right inside of the prosthesis? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> All your problems solved. Plus, add on the antenna that I did, the sensor that I'm developing. Not only can you prevent. And if for God knows what, you have some kind of infection, you can automatically detect it. <laughs> so, currently with the help of material sciences, we have three different polymers that we've made. Um, and these polymers have up to 87% killing compared, so growth and killing compared to just regular voice prosthesis. So just taking the normal prosthesis silicone Compared to that, and you grow, grow on this type of polymer, 87% is less growth. That's basically what it's saying, that you have 87% less growth compared to regular voice prosthesis polymer or silicone. So that's pretty amazing. We made a, basically, we, we made a polymer that has 87% less percent growth on it. <laughs> and that, that's amazing. Um, so what happens with this polymer exactly? So the normal standard silicone or polymer, you have what Fritz was talking about, the filamentation. It goes from yeast, it starts going into a hyphal form. And the hyphal form, as he was saying, was the infectious form, the one that's dangerous and the one that actually destroys the voice prosthesis. Whereas our polymer actually has 30% less filamentation of the attached. But you have to go back to the idea that there's 87% less attachment, less, less actual um, on the polymer, right, from, from the previous slide, um, right? So out of the 13% that actually attach, only 30% filament. That's pretty amazing. So this, this is a very new, novel new polymer that could really change the game for a lot of the patients. Because even then if you add my RFID device onto this, you can also detect out of the 13% that actually attach and 30% and of those that filament, you can actually detect them as early as eight hours. So you basically hit it from all sides. So that was very simple, very quick, and we're almost done. <laughs> So, um, yeah, you've heard from a number of people in the team, and hopefully you get a feel of the sort of passion the students have for their research, which is really great. And I think they really are um, developing some exciting new technologies. So, hopefully, what we've managed to tell you in this talk, um, you know, take you through what this MDT has actually achieved so far, and we're still obviously going on with further research, but we definitely have the first point here. We have developed clinical guidelines that are in place, they're being taken up worldwide, and they really do have an immediate patient benefit. So this will, this will benefit a lot of patients immediately, and it is benefiting a lot of patients. But we have also developed innovative research programs that have, that have spawned out of that, um, and they've started to involve further disciplines. So it's been really, really interesting to be involved in. And hopefully, perhaps most importantly, what we've shown is that you can really, really drive forward innovation and uh, treatment and therapy if you ask the right question and as a result of that gather the right people together. Once you do that you can really accelerate the process which I think is exactly what's happened here and I know that's something Kent Cancer Trust are really interested in uh, providing support for in the future. So um, what I'd ask you to do perhaps is just to show your appreciation for all of the speakers that we've heard from today. Thank you.